All right, welcome back to Noob School. Today we've got my good friend, Mike Bauer, uh, who's the one of the founders and the CEO and chairman of ScanSource, uh, one of the best businesses in Greenville. So thank you for doing this, Mike. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. The best, one of the best businesses. Wow, that's a, that's a high bar, dude. Isn't that true? I'll let you say it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we aspire to be. Well, I, I, you know, having known you for a long time, I, I, I've just seen it grow um, from the humble beginnings that are every business to what it is now. I mean, you have three or 4,000 employees. Well, we, uh, we're a couple thousand, 2,300. 2,300? Right, from six 30 years ago. From six to 2,300, and they're spread out where? Um, all across the U.S., yeah. some in Canada. We used to have a big operation in Europe, and so we did have more employees then. We yeah. sold that business okay. in 2019. Okay. But we have 900 people in Brazil. So okay. Brazil is one of our largest markets now in terms of number of employees. Wow. But we're principally a North America and Brazil company, a little okay. bit in the U.K. Okay. Got it. <clears throat> and describe the company to us. It's hard to describe what we do because mm -hmm. a lot of people, if I say what we are, which is we're a distributor, mm -hmm. that means... We buy products and we sell products. Mm -hmm. We don't manufacture. Mm -hmm. A lot of companies in the Greenville area start with manufacturing. And these days, of course, you know, there's all kinds of companies in Greenville, but we're one of those companies that have been in Greenville a long time. And there's always been, believe it or not, three or four and sometimes five different technology distributors. So we buy computer technology equipment and we sell it to other businesses. And these businesses our companies, like ours, they start small, yeah. and they get sometimes a lot larger. So we have 30,000 customers across the U.S. and Brazil who take our products and sell them into a company like a Michelin, mm -hmm. like a restaurant in town. Mm -hmm. And so we're a business-to-business -business company, and it's one of those where every day we kind of start over. Our business, almost $4 billion in revenue, yeah. and we do it $2,000 at a time. <laughs> it's a lot of hustle. It's a lot. It's it's a big operational business. Every yeah. day, we take orders and ship product, and our customers get them in one or two days. Right, that's very cool. So you you have built uh, over thirty years, you know, a, a four billion dollar company, a public company, twenty three hundred employees. Again, one of the best companies in Greenville. So one of the things I thought that the the noob school people might want to know is just kind of how it all started. And, um, and, and, you know, take back to high school and kind of how you, high school and college and your first couple of jobs, how that created the mindset that would lead you to create something like this. Well, that's a long time ago, John. I turned 65 this year. I don't know if we got time for high school, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but growing up in Anderson, South Carolina, yeah. I went to Clemson. That was like the only school for me. And I thought I wanted to be a chemical engineer. Okay. My gosh, that was a big mistake. I did. I did last for three years. Yeah. And along the way, I was taking some computer classes, mm -hmm. and one of my buddies said, hey, Mike, you really ought to get in the computer business. This was in 1980. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Wow. What computer business? Yeah. And he said, we're selling computers at Radio Shack. I'm mm -hmm. working for Radio Shack. I said, you're kidding me. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't even know what Radio Shack is. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I started working for Radio Shack in 1981. I took my buddy's advice. This was a high school buddy. And one day, you're selling CB radios back yeah. then. Yeah and capacitors and adapter plugs, and somebody walks in and wants to buy a personal computer in yeah. 1981. That cost probably then $3,000, mm -hmm. and it had uh, a tiny amount of memory. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, we used cassette tapes as storage. Um, so that, that got me excited because I had a sales mentality, mm -hmm. even from being in college, I never wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to sell mm -hmm. as a chemical engineer, but I didn't want to be an engineer. But I love the idea of selling and working in a retail store. You learn real quick whether you are going to enjoy selling because <laughs> people come in and you got to choose. Yeah. Am I going to be the guy that makes a lot of money selling or not? And so working retail sales was a great training ground for me as an early, early, um, uh, from a career standpoint. Right. 
Right. Okay. Yeah, Radio Shack, that timing couldn't have been better for the computer business. You were you were dead on the beginning, right? I mean, Apple had just come out. Right. It was Apple and Commodore, for those okay. who remember Commodore, because right. they right. had the, the Commodore 64, and we yeah. were the TRS-80. It was really those three companies, yeah. and then IBM a year later. Yeah. A year later, before yeah. IBM. Yeah. Wow. That's wild. And so you, you got the bug early. Yeah. Um, and, and then what happened? Well, I, I decided that I really liked the computer side of the business because, frankly, I could sell some resistors and capacitors, and that was like, you know, a buck ninety-eight sale, or I could sell this $3,000 computer. I'm like, I need to, I want to sell these computers. They're right. the most expensive thing we have in the store. Right. And they created at Radio Shack a computer center here in Greenville on yeah. East North Street. Right. And there you only sold computers. And right. so we were selling to businesses. So I learned what it was like then. How do you sell a computer to a business? And one of our biggest customers back then was one of the textile companies, mm-hmm. J.P. Stevens. Yeah. And they needed to be able to schedule their workers and, and manage their payroll better. And so one of the early applications for selling computers to business was to have a spreadsheet mm-hmm. so that you could keep track of everything. Mm-hmm. And so we sold our own software that was made by Radio Shack for somebody like J.P. Stevens. Those were probably... Five thousand dollar systems. Yeah, and so you sell a few of those, and you can actually make some good money. Yeah, absolutely. So you <laughs> okay? So you you went there, and you were selling the actually selling software. Yes, I didn't know that part of the story. Okay. Well, we we, we generally pretty much gave it away if you buy the hardware. We didn't understand That's it. So funny. software's where the money is. <laughs> it's like giving away the razor. Yes. Making them buy the or giving away the razor, making them buy the device. Yeah. The the blades, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. And then, how did it go from the computer thing, the computer thing, to starting ScanSource? Well, along the way at Radio Shack, I got a, a call from a headhunter, mm-hmm. and that was to go and run and be general manager for a local computer business that was within another company, and that okay. was Modern Office Machines. Okay. okay. And that was a company where I first met you, John, mm-hmm. and your dad, and T. Hooper. Yeah. So Jack Sterling, T. Hooper, and they they brought me in and interviewed me and said, "You're a Radio Shack." sales guy, we need somebody to run our computer business. I said, mm-hmm. well, what, what do you have? Mm-hmm. And this was a company they had acquired here in Greenville, small yeah. company, Carolina Computers. And they had the vision of there was going to be this merger in 1984, 85 of fax machines, if anybody still remembers those, typewriters, um, copy machines, and computers. Yeah. And that was the vision was one day this is all going to be together. Mm-hmm. And it might be one device, might not, but this is what businesses want right. some place where they can help them with all of that. And so I came in as the computer guy, not knowing that again, I was in set into selling hardware and some software and the rest of that business was about recurring revenue, mm-hmm. selling toner and paper yeah. and very profitable, but it helped me learn about other companies in the space. And one of our suppliers at mom modern office machines was a small Greenville based company and they were selling us cables and modems and that's a company that was Gates FA, or became okay. Gates FA, okay. which is where I was when we started ScanSource. So okay. I had just left Gates. So I went from Radio Shack, which was a manufacturer of computers, to working for a local dealer, a yeah. VAR, yeah. and then working for a distributor, Gates FA. So okay. I, I learned the computer um, business through all of those different opportunities with three different companies. Okay. And so <clears throat> Gates was a supplier of yours at yes. Mom. And that's how you made that jump over there is that relationship. Um, and then how do you go, this is very important if you, for these for the noob schoolers, they want to start a business. How do you go from this, from that, you know, good job to starting a business? Well, I was lucky that I had a great mentor, advisor, friend, and later really business partner, and that was Steve. So mm-hmm. when Steve Owings hired me at Gates mm-hmm. as a product manager to help them with their computer business, um, he then along the way, literally after the first year, he said, Mike, I need somebody to go start this other business within our business mm-hmm. selling computers that has our name on it. Mm-hmm. This was a little company that we literally started from scratch, but it was a, it was like a, a little fledgling idea. Mm-hmm. And Steve gave me the idea, said, what do you think? And I said, I'll do it. And so I volunteered. I was leaving a business that I was already working on within a company. And he said, would you like to try this? And mm-hmm. so I said, I'll do it. That business was called Argent Technologies. Okay. And after about a year and a half, we decided to take Argent out from underneath Gates FA and make it its own separate company. Mm-hmm. And that was really um, an idea to make that go big. 
And then six months later, we decided that business was going to have to be shut down. Mm -hmm. Six months into it. Mm -hmm. Because Compact Computer, one of the big computer companies, decided to compete very strongly against companies like ours. And so we had to actually decide to shut down that business and go find another one to start. <laughs> yeah. This was all within a year. Yeah. And I was feeling good, and then I was feeling terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Like, what are we going to do? Right, right. Yeah. And that, that, that had to really sting because that was, from an entrepreneur's perspective, the thought of creating the next computer. Right. You know, it's so cool. It's such a Especially cool Especially one thing. named Arjun. Doesn't that sound cool? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so y'all had to shut, make the grown-up decision to shut that down, not going to compete with Compaq and Apple and some of those people, right. uh, IBM. Right. Um, Lots of competitors. But you already had, I would say, the experience that you had gotten and yep. the experience Steve had running distribution businesses. And you said, what, what, how can we make this work? Right. We said, what can we do with the team of people we have? Yeah. How do we then leverage all of our relationships? Mm -hmm. And that was the idea of let's go find another business like Gates that right. we were in selling computers that needs distribution. Let's mm -hmm. go find another industry that lacks efficient distribution. Right. And that's how we got in the barcode business and started ScanSource. Yeah. There, was this, there was this gaping hole. There were... Mm -hmm. Customers that we were used to, technology resellers, and they were buying these barcode products, yeah. but not from a distributor. They right. were having to go to multiple manufacturers, yeah. multiple contracts. It wasn't easy. There was a lot of friction, and there was a lot of extra cost because of that. So we came with the idea of, well, is this a big enough industry first? Mm -hmm. And if it is, can we bring the scale of distribution that we were used to in the computer industry to this niche industry. Right. And it turned out it was a much bigger opportunity than we thought. Right. Much bigger. Yeah, you never but know. nobody wanted us to be successful. <laughs> None of the manufacturers thought they needed a distributor. They all said, no, guys, we don't need a distributor. But if direct. you want to do it, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I just think it's an interesting point, just to, just to stay on it for a second, because it's very normal for you to have that discussion. But for the, for the noob schoolers out there, you know, this was not about the idea. This was about the fact that you already had the people and you'd already paid your dues. Yeah. Because you can be sitting around, you know, with, with no experience and say, I've got an idea. We're going to start a barcode distribution company, right? But you don't know anything about barcoding or distribution or sales or right. raising money or, you know, contacts in the industry, all the stuff y'all had. Right. It's not going to work. So, you know, learning what you're doing in whatever field you choose, that's that's probably your best your best bet to be ready when you find that that niche. I think that's right, John. And I think the other part of it was we identified that there was a need in the market that was being unmet. Yeah. And so we had to actually go survey and talk to customers before we had anything to sell them. Yeah. And we said, what are your biggest pain points as yeah. a reseller? Yeah. And they kept telling us over and over the same thing. We worked really hard to build a uh, uh, project and sell it to the customer. And then when we're ready to start buying the product and installing it, it's not available. Right. And then we immediately have to kind of start over or switch vendors. And if we, had, if we just had a place mm -hmm. where we could count on that we could trust them, yeah. that they wouldn't compete with us. Because this was us working with their customers together with them and not going around them. So we started the company with basically two main premises. One, we will never compete with you, so you can trust us. Yeah. And two, we will get you the product as soon as tomorrow if you need it, because we're going to have inventory. Right. So we actually we actually invested in inventory product. Nobody was inventorying these products. Mm -hmm. And so it was always a 30 to 60 day lead time. We turned 30 to 60 days into next day. Right. And how big is your warehouse? Is it Mississippi? Yeah, it's, it's right outside of Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah, okay. It is across the state line. Uh, about 800,000 square feet. Wow. So we'll have about, at any one day, $400 million worth of product sitting there ready to go. And right. we get about, in the U.S., 4,000 orders a day that come in from our sales teams yeah. across the country. Yeah. And they don't come in at 8 o'clock, by the way. They all come in around 2 o'clock, about right now. <laughs> and so all those orders are being picked right now, yeah. and they all get shipped tonight yeah. by around 8 o'clock. So yeah. we do all that in about six hours. Wow. That's wild. Well, let's talk about um, let's talk about salespeople for a minute. I mean, you obviously are a natural salesperson, and I think a great curiosity about technology you, you've always had. You've always had that. I remember you showed me the the Palm Pilot thing, yes. you know, and 
That was that was a long time ago. That was yes. I'm a I'm I'm one of those gadget guys. I'm an early adopter of technology. Right, yes, right. yes, I love it. Um, but on the sales side, what have you found on your team? Like, what are you looking for when you're interviewing for salespeople? One of the things that we we did learn early was we did not need people who necessarily understood the technology, although that was very helpful. Yeah. Um, matter of fact, we've got a salesperson who will be with us 30 years in April. And um, her name is Phyllis, and she mm-hmm. was from our first acquisition. And I was asking Phyllis, because we're getting ready for a little company meeting, mm-hmm. and I was saying, Phyllis, remind me of your background. And she used to install computer systems at Kmart. Wow. And she came to work for us with that knowledge, but she was an exception. Most everybody else came to us from um, some other training ground, if not right from college. And the key was they had to, they had to get comfortable that they could learn the technology. I think... Many times, salespeople, rightly so, they don't want to sell something they're not 100% comfortable or confident with. Yeah. And we had to find a way to overcome that. And the answer to that was, number one, our first two sales reps, Janet and Sherry, they knew nothing about barcoding, mm-hmm. but they weren't afraid to ask for the order. Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, they would call a customer and they would say, hi, I'm Janet. I'm with this company, ScanSource. Can you tell me what you guys are selling in your business, they would say, well, why do you want to know? Well, because we're a distribution company and we'd like to provide you what you're selling, what you're buying. And what is it you buy? Oh, we buy zebra printers. Okay, well, if I had zebra printers for you, would you buy them for me? And they're like, you don't have any? Well, not yet. But if one day we get them, would you buy? So that's how we started the company. We had no customers and not even any suppliers. So we had to first understand what the market need was. Mm -hmm. And we kept hearing, but we'd love to buy from somebody who doesn't compete with us somebody who would give us fair pricing. Yeah. And it was amazing how those early sales reps just had to be able to ask questions yeah. and not get intimidated when they didn't know the answer. Matter of fact, one of my questions for a new sales rep was, what, what's your response to a customer when you don't know the answer? Hmm. And if they said anything other than, um, I don't know the answer, let me go find out, <laughs> yeah. I would say you're not going to be successful this company because right. you're never going to know everything. Right. So right. you've got to make sure that to build trust, you got to let people know that you're not going to know everything, but you'll get the answer for them and get right back. Right. John, that was one of the keys we had to learn. Because hmm. there would be a lot to learn in your business. Impossible to know it all. Yeah. But yeah. we have a team behind our salespeople, yeah. our engineers, yeah. and they can find the answer right. pretty quick. Right. And that was the key was you had to find the answer and then quickly get back to the customer. Not mm-hmm. tomorrow, not in a week, yeah. but fast. And I think yeah. that quick response, hey, I don't know the answer, I'll get right back to you. That was amazing. Yeah, your people hustle, man. Um, and you're, are you still doing like uh, product training every week? Yes. Okay. Matter of fact, I, our suppliers, they compete to get in front of our salespeople. They okay. want to do it. And now, frankly, since all the changes since the pandemic and remote learning and, and video, mm-hmm. we can do so much more training now than ever before because okay. it's easy to do it. Everybody doesn't have to be in a room. Right. We don't have to organize somebody to come on a plane and come visit. So yeah. I think training is even easier today. Yeah, yes. interesting. Um, let's just talk about that for a second because you had, you know, how many people did you have on Pelham Road before the pandemic? 700 that would show up every day. Yep. Yeah. And now and now, it's 100. Mo- mostly work from home? Yeah, 100 might show up on a, on a normal day. Yeah. And we, we came up with the idea that we're calling it productivity anywhere. Mm-hmm. If you're productive... Work where you're most productive. Yeah. And we found that to be amazingly successful. Yeah. Amazingly successful. Yeah. Different people work different ways. Uh, I know. I mean, I've seen, uh, I've talked to people about this, but, you know, if someone is hyper productive, if they really, really go after it hard without having to do as many meetings or uh, commuting or lunch with everyone or, you know, all those (laughs) things, you know, that we used to do in corporate America. You could block your time to like 6 to 10 in the morning as day one. You could probably get as much done as you used to in in day one. But then, so you can goof off the rest of the day, California style, if you want to. Or you can say, you know, 11 to 3 is day two. You know, 4 to 7 is day three. Right. You have three days. Right. Unbelievable. And, And these days, I think what a lot of them do, I don't know this for sure, is that's when they can go and learn. Yeah. Because there's so many things available now on YouTube, as we all know, yeah. just like this uh, session we're doing. And for a new person to our industry to be able to go out and get 
uh, educated on demand yeah. is amazing. And that's why if we get curious people to come to workforce, they will, they will come up to speed fast. Yeah. They just have to want it. Yeah, I agree. Well, it's, inter- it's a very interesting time for sure, for sure. And I think you've handled that well. Productivity anywhere is a smart way to do it. And, of course, we have to, at different levels in our company, the management team, they have to define what's productivity. <laughs> right. It was the measure. Yeah. And the ch- I think the most challenging part has been for those new people. Yeah. So for the noob school folks, when you join a company today that says productivity anywhere, if you're new mm-hmm. and you're not showing up, you're probably making a big mistake mm-hmm. because it's going to be hard to meet people who might one day help you yeah. if you're going to have to set up a call with them via Teams or Zoom or mm-hmm. WebEx. Much easier to walk the halls and say, hey, how are you? I'm Mike. Yeah. And that's how so many people, especially the new salespeople, that's how you've got to learn the company and learn the culture mm-hmm. and kind of learn, um, I think it'd be hard remote only to learn kind of the cadence of the company. Mm-hmm. Is how fast does this company expect me to move? And yeah. what is the cycle every day that I have to be at? And yeah. do I have to show up at six or do, can I show up at eight? And Mm-hmm. And I think uh, for a new person, especially if this is their first or second job, mm-hmm. really hard to understand that cadence. Because I would say we run at, a, at very specific cadences, again, based on our customers. Mm-hmm. When they call or when they email or when they need something, we need to be, we're, we, our business is based on we have to be available. Well, didn't you used to have, a, you might still have it, but the rule was the four hour rule? From the time that someone got a voicemail or an email, they had to respond within four hours. Absolutely, yeah. and, and and yet at the same time, I was one of those guys that was holding back on investing in some instant messaging tools early <laughs> on. I'm like, we don't need that stuff, and you know, and I didn't realize how getting them out of email mm-hmm. and getting them on instant messaging was yeah. going to let them do that. Yeah. And I was like, okay, now I get it. That's yeah. why you guys need instant message because you got to meet the four hour rule. Right, and, and so. We were always slow in investing in our own technology, and yeah. we were we were running off of really old systems until 2016. We were, whatever, we were 20 plus years in the business before we put on a went away from green screens because we were always about efficiency and right. low cost. Yeah. Our business is based on if we're the lowest cost provider, mm-hmm. we can win any deal we want. And yeah. if you're a sales team, if you're working for a company that has the lowest cost, not the lowest price, the lowest cost, mm-hmm. you can win anything you want. Then it's yeah. a choice. Yeah. Do we want to win that deal? Or not? Yeah. Well, it is, it is kind of hard to believe that you got a four billion dollar a year company that's turning over the business every day. You know, like you know, every day the orders every come day you in start and, over and they're out. You know, it's like <laughs> here I'm going back into work today. You know, every day. And part of it is our customers because they're businesses. Yeah. They're repeat buyers. Yeah. Once they find their team within ScanSource to work with, yeah. they then get influenced by our sales team on what else should I be selling. Mm-hmm. And so there's frequent communication. And the idea is if we can reduce the cost to serve for that customer, then he's going to be more successful. And yeah. if our customers grow, we grow. Mm-hmm. Well, switching gears a little bit, um, you know, you have a lot of transactional activity going on, but but like you said, they're, the people have these bigger relationships with the customer and also with your suppliers. Right. How would you recommend salespeople go from being more of a transactional salesperson to being a trusted partner? You know, one of the things we learned is that uh, you mentioned suppliers. With our business, understanding who the suppliers and their sales teams are helps our sales team win. And my point is, Getting recruiting others to help you sell mm-hmm. is an amazing way to be more successful. So it's not just you. So in our case, some of our suppliers, they have field salespeople who are trying to meet quota, mm-hmm. and they're looking for someone to say, hey, how can I help you close your quota this month? Mm-hmm. And then you get them helping you, and they'll send you business. Yeah. So we found that that's the most successful sales uh, mechanism is working with our suppliers. And if you if they trust you that... If we give you a lead Mm -hmm. and you follow up on the lead, even if you don't close it, by giving them feedback, they're going to send you more. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's always about getting an ecosystem of people helping you be successful. And everybody wants to see a a successful sales rep do more. Right. Right. And and I think once you start having a reputation for you give me the lead, I'll close it, or I will bring you back why it didn't, they're going to give you more. And I think that makes it almost easy to be a sales rep. Right. 
is people want to help you win. Right. So your reps, your reps would reach out to the people that they're like, let's say Honeywell or whoever it is, and get their field reps to help go out there and close the deal. Right. The nice. field reps all have leads. Yeah. And they're and, and the call can be early. Hey, do you have any small customer leads that you don't have time for? Right. And the field rep says, yeah, I do. I got five here. Do you mind? Yeah. No, I got them. Yeah. And I'll give you feedback. Yeah. And boy, immediately you fill up your funnel. So you're, you're leveraging your, your suppliers to give yourself a two or three times bigger sales force. Exactly. Nice. And it's amazing how effective that is. And, and it works for everybody. Yeah. It works for the suppliers and it works for our teams too. And, and actually, that, that's always been the case with ScanSource is the largest suppliers prefer our sales team and our largest customers prefer our sales team. Mm -hmm. uh, we found that, that it's that relationship, and it, it gets back to one thing, John, and that's if you can build trust mm -hmm. with your customer, mm -hmm. um, you're golden. Yeah. You're, you're gonna be successful no matter what happens right. from recession, economy, none of that matters if you've got trust with your customers. Right. And, th and that comes, I'm guessing, with time and just delivering on promise after promise. It does not come from sitting down the first time with a big dinner at Hall's Chop House and saying, <laughs> I want to be your trusted partner, right? You're exactly right. Yeah. It's, it's got to be one deal, one opportunity at a time. Yeah. And it does take time, um, but it also doesn't take years. Right. It just takes um, um, doing something, uh, giving feedback, yeah. and then being somebody that, you know, consistent. I think consistency builds a long-term sales relationship in our in our company. Right. Consistency. They can People want to know they can count on you. Right. Not changing. Every yeah. And quarter. even if you have a problem. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll never forget one of our most successful sales reps, Janet Rollins, one of our first two. Um, I would go visit her customer, say, "Now, tell me, why do you do business with our company, and mm -hmm. why do you like scan uh, Janet?" Mm -hmm. And they would say, "Because Janet gives me the truth. Mm -hmm. If if I call her and say, do you have this product?' and she says, "No, we're out of stock," she tells me where I can go buy it. Yeah, and and people are blown away by that. Yeah. they they never fail to say. We trust you guys. You will never give us an answer just to keep us on the hook. Right. That's huge. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, let's let's talk about uh, positive attitude, which you you uh, you kind of show us. You have such a great example for the rest of us. You always have a great positive outlook on things. And I know that just like everyone else, it's not always positive, right? I mean, there's always challenges and stuff we're working through. Every quarter is not smooth. But I wondered what kind of advice you'd give to keep. Um, to, to, to put things in your brain to keep you positive and what you want to keep out. What do you want to let in? What do you want to keep out? Well, um, you know, one of the things I learned early in my management career was about a balanced life. You know, and, and sometimes I would suffer and not follow my own, my own thinking on mm -hmm. this, but I always would tell my teams that when I struggle, it's when I'm not balanced. And I think of life should be balanced with what do you need to do for yourself, mm -hmm. What do you need to do for your family? Mm -hmm. And what do you do for your company? Mm -hmm. And so it's an equilateral triangle. And whenever you oversteer in any one of those areas, yeah. the rest of your life um, is not good. Mm -hmm. You can oversteer for a short period of time, but not for long. And so when things seem bad, you need to kind of look around and make sure that it's because not because something else is causing that. And, I, and so I've been a big believer in, as, as salespeople, take care of yourself. Make sure you do... You have a fitness routine. Yeah. You care about your family. You have friends. There's got to be life outside of selling. And if you can balance that correctly, you're going to be so successful, even, even during tough times. Because, right. again, it's not always easy. Right. You've talked about that a lot. Right. And, uh, and, and you're going to have tough years. And some of, some of my best advice these days is coming from my team in Brazil. Because when we look at... For example, being in the U.S., mm -hmm. everybody talks about all the problems, mm -hmm. the macro things, mm -hmm. politics, the economy. Mm -hmm. um, that's a country that every year has a problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, every year they have recession. Every right. year they have interest rates high. They had an impeachment of the president two years ago. And those are the most positive people I've ever met. And mm -hmm. so I have become more positive over time because I look at how other successful people and cultures do it. And I think the culture of the company, I think it's very important that Everyone in the company is positive, even when things don't go well. Right. Even when they don't, you have to still say, "We can do better." Right. We can do better. Right. It's not always going to be like this. Right. And so I, I, I do feel like um, that tone has to be set by the management team every day. Right. 
every day. Well, that's great. That's great feedback because you, you always show that positive attitude. But I think it's just, I think it's real. I think you're looking at the positive outlook on everything. And when something unpleasant does happen, it's to say, well, now what? You know, what are we going to do now? How can we make this work? Right. You know, how do we fix it? You know, yeah. whatever. It's just, it's, it's, and I think also I tell people and myself that when something does happen like that, you say, well, there it is. You know, I knew it was coming. Sure. Right? Eventually, you know, <laughs> the, 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 we're going to have a flat tire every now and then. Let's just fix it and let's keep going. Right. You know, most of the time it's life is great. Well, and that's back to what you said, John, is you, you can't keep it all internal. You got to share it too. Yeah. And people are okay if we make mistakes. One of our core values at ScanSource is mistakes made for the right reason are okay and should be celebrated mm -hmm. because we want people also that are pushing the envelope. Right. We want to encourage risk-taking to right. a point. Yeah. And that's how you get through these tough times is your company has to say, okay, everyone's going to have this problem. Mm -hmm. it's a, it, so now how do we go beat the competitors mm -hmm. right now? And this yeah. is what uh, noob school folks need to think about is when the going gets tough, everybody has the same problem. Mm -hmm. And so how do you do better than the competitor? Right. That's the key. Right, right. Good advice. So let's, uh, I know occasionally, I mean, you, you've had some some big deals that you've been involved in in your career, um, buying some great companies. Uh, I'm sure you've been involved in, in some monster sales and supplier kind of deals. Can you talk about one of those deals and just describe how a big deal gets done? Because most noob school people don't understand how could I do a $50 million deal or a $2 million deal because most of us would start selling something that's like $8,000, you know? Yeah. So how does a bigger deal work? Well, um, that's interesting uh, about acquisitions. I hadn't thought about that in a while, but I'll give you an example of one of those. We Scansers did over 30 acquisitions in 30 years, mm -hmm. and they from uh, 4 or $5 million to um, $250 million. I can tell you about one that was about $100 million. It started out as a company that I met, that I was in, very much impressed with the management team, their market, um, and, I, and I talked to the owner, saw him at a conference, mm -hmm. and just got to know him personally. Just, hey, how you doing? How's your business? And then found out that he might be for sale through somebody else, and I said, well, maybe I'll just approach him. So I approached him and said, hey, if one day your business, you're interested in exiting your business, we would be interested in talking. He mm -hmm. said, that's great. And so then like six months later, I get the phone call. But mm -hmm. first it was starting with some kind of relationship somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it ends up being, you got to then ask. Mm -hmm. You got to ask either that person or somebody around them, is it possible they're for sale? So right. first you got to do a little research. Yeah. But then once you make the first um, meeting that's about closing the deal. And in our case, we took about six months and determined it wouldn't happen uh -huh. because there was an expectation that the seller had the customer for here and we were here. Mm -hmm. And so there was a gap. Mm -hmm. And rather than at that point, try to negotiate and the gap was large, too large to where we were going to negotiate the difference, mm -hmm. no matter what Bill Garcia says. Yeah. I mean, this one was a big gap. Yeah. And what I had learned then was it's better to walk away, walk away with, Hey, this is not going to work out. Um, if you guys are still interested in a couple of years from mm -hmm. now, let's get back together. That happened twice with this particular deal. Wow. And it went from where we were going to offer to pay $60 million, I think, $50 million mm -hmm. the first time we met. And three years later, we did buy that business for $100 million. Mm. They got what they wanted. Mm -hmm. They kept in touch. I would occasionally just throw in a little uh, phone call or an email and say, hey, I'm going to be in town. Would you want to get together? Yeah. I met the guy one time for a little ski um, trip out mm -hmm. in California. Mm -hmm. But staying in contact, um, making sure, though, that there was no hard feelings. Mm -hmm. And I also learned that don't throw a lowball offer out there just to m either let them know that you're, you know, you're smarter than they are. Mm -hmm. That never worked. Right. I always would walk away and not give – if I knew the gap was too big, yeah. I'd rather walk away – Keep the relationship alive and see if it'll work. Right. And and that worked for me three or four times, John. Right. And so that gap was made up by their revenue growing or something. They grew, yeah. 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 And but they also knew then what was it we were looking for. Right. What was the measure right. of of profitability going to be? Or what right. would in other words, in this guy's case, he wanted to sell it for a hundred million dollars. Right. And he had to know for me what would his 
business have to look like yeah. for us to pay him? Yeah. He figured it out. Yeah. Good for him. Yeah. Everyone's happy. <laughs> yeah. That's and good. so that was a wonderful one, but it was those, back to not, but not, in, not embarrassing him with a low yeah. ball offer either. I never yeah. liked people that would do that. That yeah. was never our style. Yeah. Well, that's, those are good. Those are good lessons. I mean, you don't want to, if it's going to be, a, I mean, back to being a trusted partner, right. you don't want to make them angry or make them look bad or just, you know, politely walk away yeah. until it's stay in touch. Yeah. That's and let good. them know why yeah. as, as, as best you can, again, without insulting them. Yeah. You don't want to tell somebody their baby's ugly. Right, right, right. <laughs> Even if it is, John. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting, I think, for the noob schoolers, and for me too, it's just interesting how much of the personal touch comes in on doing a $100 million yeah. acquisition. Yeah. It's not just like, you know, let me just, it's, we'll offer 100 you know. Yeah, it's right, like, right, exactly right. And people are people, <laughs> they right? Are people people yes. are people. Yes, and they appreciate it. And I can't tell you how many times we did that very successfully, and rarely, by the way, were we the highest bidder, mm -hmm. rarely. Mm -hmm. We had to be close. Yeah. We had to be close, but the fact that we were willing to work with them over time I don't think we were ever in an auction but one time as mm -hmm. a result of that. Yeah. We identified where we wanted to go, yeah. met them early, mm -hmm. let them know what our metrics would be, and then just kind of be patient. I mean, right. being patient is hard for a salesperson like me, too. I bet. And, you know, but you have to sometimes figure out, all right, this one's worth being patient for right. if one day we can close it. Right. But it's kind of like having a funnel. you gotta, you got to know some of those aren't going to happen right away, right. but keep working them. Right. I like that. I like that. And it's the same with if they were trying to sell big deals or anything else. I mean, you can't, as much as you'd like to, you know, I, I tell the noob schoolers, it's, it's, not a, it's not a this month thing. Right. You know, we're talking, look at your career over 10 or 20 or 30 years. What are you arcing towards? Right. You know? Um, well, let's switch and talk about interviewing, which I know you've, you've, you've done a lot of. Now you're doing only, you know, executives and stuff. But um, what are some of the things that people have done in interviews on the good side and on the bad side? What, what do you recommend they do if they want to get a job? And what are the things they do if, if they're not going to get the job? <laughs> Boy, it's, it certainly changed from when I was interviewing. I can still remember, John, interviewing some early salespeople back in the days when you were at DataStream and, and ScanSource was a lot smaller. Um, and I was telling someone this recently that I, my goal was to get someone to stay with us for three years. And mm -hmm. I would tell them, if you'll commit to being here three years and then you then step up and go work for somebody else, I will have gotten a good return on our investment. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, we've got, as I was saying earlier, we got a sales rep that's been with us 30 years. Mm -hmm. And she could have gone lots of other places. Yeah. And so having that kind of a, a mindset that don't make somebody feel guilty if they leave, mm -hmm. It also allows me to then say, but I want you to work 110% every day. Mm -hmm. You got to give it all you got, mm -hmm. and if that means three years, great. If it means ten, wonderful. Mm -hmm. And and some of the things I learned along the way were people trying to um, people trying to use their industry knowledge, and and partly it was really my managers, John, where they would want us to hire people that had industry knowledge, meaning they, they wanted us to hire from competitors. So mm -hmm. one of the things I learned was. I didn't like to interview people that were working for our direct competitor. <laughs> I felt like that was almost like on our side too easy because, mm -hmm. of course, we thought we could win them over. Yeah. Um, I also was wondering why were they ever working for that company? Right. So if they came to me trying to brag on the fact that look at all of my resume, I was never impressed with that. That yeah. was a way to turn me off as, oh, I know your business. I'm like, I don't think you do. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. And so to me, I think you have to be careful about selling your industry knowledge or experience, I'm not sure that's the best. I think the best the best interviewers that I had over the years were people who were much more about, um, after a couple of sentences, me asking them, hey, what questions do you have about ScanSource? Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to know how much did they really know? Mm -hmm. Did they do their homework? Yeah. And so early in the interview, I was like, what questions can I ask you? Just trying to figure out, are they going to ask me about how much they're going to get paid? Yeah. Or what's the company's future? Right. So those are very interesting yeah. ant questions and answers is, what questions do you have for me? Yeah, yeah. I remember that too. I remember if someone said, well, I was wondering what the insurance plan was like. <laughs> yeah, I was like, right. out. <laughs> out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or I mean, what's the vacation policy, yeah. right? <laughs> I mean, dress code. I mean, come on. <laughs> right, those were, those were easy, right? Yeah, I mean, we want them to be interested in what we're doing. Yeah, curious. Yeah. 
and, and and you you would hope again even even at, even with salespeople um, that they would want to understand what are the career opportunities ahead. Yeah. I mean, if I really you know do a great job, what's possible? And mm-hmm. I love talking about what's possible, mm-hmm. not not what's guaranteed, or yeah. but what's possible. What what could somebody like me accomplish at your company, Mr. Right. Bauer? That yeah. that would be a great question. Great for me. question. Yeah. 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 We coach them to have three at least three questions ready to go, and one of them we love the question. You know, if 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 you if you hire me, Mike, and I'm you know a year from now. What would a great job look like? There you go. And yes. so you're telling me what my first year looks like. So in your head, you've already hired me, right? <laughs> right. I'm already been here. I love it. I love so it. I, That's I, a great question. I like that question. I yeah, like I do too. And, and and I again, I like the interview candidates having a couple of questions yeah. like that. I think it's great. I don't. I think it's uh, it's a little bit the assumptive close, but I love that because that's yeah. what you want in a salesperson. Yeah. I also love at the very end before we go. So one more thing, Mike. How do I do? Yeah. Well, scale of one to ten, what do you think? Yeah, thinking? that's a good Am one. I eight, nine, what are you thinking? That's a good one. <laughs> I mean, it, it makes why you, not? It makes you cringe a little bit, but you're like, I'm hiring a salesperson. Right. I want him to say that. Right. You know? Right. Yeah. Well, and and for me, whether it's a salesperson or an executive, I want them to always um, believe that they're going to be very successful right. at our company. I mean. I want them to. We're not just one of seven seven other ones are interviewing that, and mm-hmm. I know it's harder today, but um, I want somebody who really wants to be here. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, so that they're going to do everything they can to be successful. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the the uh, transformation from hardware only to kind of more of a SaaS pricing and bundling that you're doing? Well, I'll tell you, the, big, the biggest change in our company was when we, in 2016, acquired this recurring revenue company, mm-hmm. Intellisys, and, and it really ch- had changed our whole mindset about where will our business come from. Instead of today having to start over with hardware, we've got three-year contracts that pay us monthly for yeah. three years. I'm like, whoa, this is cool. <laughs> yeah. Where has this been all of our life? Yeah. And so when we found that opportunity, then it was, how do we integrate that in with our company? Because it was so different. Mm-hmm. And I think it's still a challenge with our channel, with our customers, because we want every one of our customers who sell hardware to also sell some recurring service. Yeah. Um, it used to be, you know, a long time ago, 20 years ago, it was um, trying to help them get into the software business, but even though we weren't selling the software. But we knew that for a successful customer of ours to be around a long time, they had to have a predictable source of profitability. And it wasn't going to be just hardware. Mm-hmm. It was some kind of services. And so when we found this uh, recurring revenue services model, selling cloud services, it has been just a phenomenal change for our company mm-hmm. because now it gives not only our customers a, a real opportunity in the future that's massive, mm-hmm. but also our sales teams. Our sales teams now can say, well, you know what? I've been selling hardware. Maybe I want to sell some recurring or yeah. maybe I want to do both. Yeah. The idea is to do both, yeah. and that's what we're calling hybrid distribution. Right. If we can do both, then, um, frankly, you're hedging your bets. Right. We, we believe that every time you sell recurring, there's also some kind of device needed somewhere. And um, I think that's the part that gets misunderstood, is that you should try to do one without the other. I think you can, but they're better together, and we call that hybrid. Well, I know the example you gave me once was the security, look at the alarm in your house, your alarm system. Yes, yes. That, that's hardware and software and right. telephone, and it's, you get one bill right. a month, right? Exactly. You don't pay for the hardware. That's right, and yeah. it reminds me of back when I was younger, and we had landline phones, which aren't around much anymore, and those were all um, sold by the month. Right. You, you never owned it. Right. The, the phone company owned it, right. and you paid a monthly bill, yeah. and you got a phone, and you got dial tone. And if you wanted a longer cord, it was another buck fifty a month. They, they were they were ahead of the ahead of the curve, weren't they? They were. Yeah. And then of course they got so successful, the government blew them up. Right. That's unbelievable. The well, old was forever new. Well, one of the uh, one of the kind of themes or words I like to talk about is head trash. You know, things that we believe are true for whatever reason, because we saw a million ads about it or because our mother told us or whatever. And an example would be, you know, a mother saying, uh, money doesn't grow on trees. You know, so you hear that your whole life growing up and you think, well, there's, there's just not enough money around. I can't make any money. And then when you get older, you read that there's about a billion millionaires. You know, there's just there's so many millionaires in the world and so many billionaires. It's like, well, maybe maybe it's more abundant than I thought. 
So do you have any head trash things that you've kind of discovered in your life? Well, for sure, you know, early in the life of ScanSource, there were so many people telling us um, there wasn't, it wasn't a big enough market. Mm -hmm. I've always heard people say that, that yeah. you guys are doing a good job, but the end is in sight. I right. mean, for years, we went public really early, and there were other public companies that were kind of dabbling in our business, but they were doing a lot more business in the computer industry. Yeah. And every time I would go see an investor back in those early days, um, the investor would say, well, Mike, what's going to happen when these three competitors get in your business? <laughs> yeah. I said, I'm not worried about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, we'll, we'll beat them. Yeah. We're, we're the best now. Yeah. Why, why do you think they're going to beat us? Well, because they're bigger and all this. Mm. And so I think people want to try to intimidate you with this idea of competitors and you can't let it. I mean, yeah. I think that's an easy one to like get dis depressed about. Oh yeah, right. right. You know, yeah. One day we're going to lose. Too small. The business is gone. And and I've heard that my whole life. Yeah. If somebody else is going to beat you guys, Mike. Are you ready for it? Yeah. Well, of course we're ready. Yeah. So we had a guy. Do you remember Al Reese? The yeah, sure. Guy? Yeah. So he came to help us when we were doing five million a year. Yeah. And we were convinced our market was too small. Yeah. Larry and I convinced each other with based on our yeah, right. our, our homework. <laughs> we're just too small. We need right. to find something else, you know. Right. And this guy came in and he's like, Well, I don't know about that. And he goes, You're going thirty percent a year. Just keep doing that as long as you can. He goes, You'd be surprised what the market might do. There and now go. that company that we sold is now doing three hundred million a year. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a it's a hell of a market. So I mean I I think you're right. And I also it reminds me, when they talk about goal setting, they say for goodness sakes, don't tell anyone what your goals are because right. most people don't want you to make it. Right. They, they, for whatever reason, they want to pull you. Like, like you and I want each other to do well, but a lot right. of people are like, no, nah, that's, that's not never going to work, Mike. Right, exactly. Not going to work because they don't, you know. Yeah, yeah, there are some people that don't understand what it takes to be successful, and so they think it's um, luck. Yeah. It's luck. Yeah. And they don't want you to be lucky if they can't be lucky. <laughs> and they don't realize that it's a lot of work, yeah. And it's and it's surrounding yourself with a lot of great people. And I think it's back to you have to uh, to grow a company, um, you have to have people that are like you, but that also are have the freedom yeah. to innovate. And and but all of them have to have commonalities around core values, John, about trust and integrity and doing the right thing and um and and being really good leaders of people. Yeah. And that's what our company is all about. We keep hiring great people. Um, and the great ones, by the way, one day are going to leave you. And I, you know, for me, that was always hard. I don't know about you, John. It's mm -hmm. when some of your best people got offers that we yeah. couldn't match, but right. it was good for them. Yeah. And I think that was one of the hardest parts of the job for me was was congratulating somebody on finding something that was bigger and better for their family. And I right. want to say, if that's good for your family, then I understand it. Yeah, yeah. But that that's was good. hard. Well, it's a good point. Well, you've got a great team out there now. You've got a great team out there now. Um, so a couple more questions, Mike. What, what would be your favorite word? I think aggressiveness. I mean, okay. I've always thought that um, you've got to take some risk and you've got to be aggressive. And I think it's too easy to be complacent. And just, mm -hmm. again, you, if you, if you, you have to be careful what you read and watch and hear yeah. because there's so many people, again, that are negative. <laughs> and I'm like, forget that. Yeah. Forget all that. Yeah. Let's get aggressive. Let's assume that we can win. Yeah. And I'm a glass half full guy. I always have been. Yeah. Always. Three always. quarters. Three quarters. Always. There you go. Three quarters. Even yeah. better. That's right. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. I love that. I love that. Hmm. Well, is there anything uh, that you want to promote today? I think this idea that... Um, we are going to have an amazing run in our company and companies like ours. And to new salespeople, salespeople are not going away. Yeah. When I think about all of the AI innovation that's coming, mm. we're, we're looking at that like which jobs at ScanSource are going to get automated yeah. more and more. And or, by the way, near shore and mm -hmm. offshore because mm -hmm. every company looks at that over time, right? Mm -hmm. It's not sales jobs. It's right. not, I mean, if, if I was giving some advice to new salespeople, you stay in this lane. Mm -hmm. You're going to be wonderfully successful if you try. Yeah. And, and sales isn't for everybody, but anyone, in my opinion, anyone can learn to be a salesperson. Right. It's, it can be taught. Right. It can be learned. Yes. Now, you have to like pick, pick your place, and some businesses are easier than others. You and I used to talk about ScanSource was not as much a cold-calling 
I called it uh, raw meat sales mm -hmm. job mm -hmm. um, because we had repeat customers, mm -hmm. whereas you had a lot of new customers. So you need a lot of hunters. Mm -hmm. We need we needed farmers. Right. So if you want to be a farmer sales rep, it, by the way, it doesn't mean that it's easy. Right. But you can be a very successful farmer for a career. Yeah. And I and I I think that gets. Um, that gets misunderstood. Right. And because right. our jobs are generally inside sales, and mm -hmm. that is not easy. Right. Not easy, but right. it's a very successful career. So I would just encourage people to um, uh, come after any company where you can get into sales because from sales, you can move into the company at other levels whenever you're ready. Whenever you're ready. Yeah. There, there's a, you know, there's tons of CEOs that came out of the sales, sales side. Correct. I mean, maybe half of them. I agree. So... I agree. You don't have to, and you don't have to be a financial genius to be the CEO. I can tell you, I'm not. <laughs> and and uh, again, I'm a guy that was working retail Radio Shack stores back in 1981, and uh, I learned how to count money. You know, yeah. but I also learned what it took over those years to be curious, yeah. and to be and to self educate, and to want to do more. And to and if you want to do more, people will help you if you ask them. Yeah. And that was one of the earliest things I heard too was. Make sure you ask people to help you, mm -hmm. just like you. I know you will. If someone wants advice, um, they'll ask John Sterling if they if they want advice on sales. They yeah. should. So, Mike, I forgot to ask you what uh, what's your favorite book? There's a book that I read recently called Lift Off, okay. and I would highly recommend it. Lift Off. Lift Off by Eric Berger. This is this is uh, nonfiction. This is the history. And the story of SpaceX. Mm. And it's a great read. It reads like fiction. It is so unbelievable about how Elon Musk started this company in 2002. And he almost, well, well they basically failed four times <laughs> launching rockets. He, he bet all of his money and they finally got it right. But SpaceX, most people know about today, launching all the time. Yeah. 2002, they started. It's not fast to build a rocket company. But he's one of those entrepreneurs and he's a great salesman, too. And so yeah. I would highly recommend you read Lift Off by okay. Eric Berger. I'm going to read it. Thank you. You're welcome. So let's keep going. Do you have any questions for me? Anything you want to ask? We don't have to. Um, yeah. Okay. Fire away. So these young salespeople, mm -hmm. what is their expectation for incentives today? Because I've been trying to work on this one is, Back in the day, we used to have all kinds of sales spiffs and trips and all that. And, and I'm, I don't know. What are you hearing? Is what, what do they want outside of a paycheck, outside of a commission check? What else is going to get them excited? Because my kids and your kids, you know, the 20 and 30-year-olds, they seem to have a different view of um, what motivates them. And I'm, what I'm trying to get to is what's going to motivate them beyond just the paycheck yeah. today? Well, I'll tell you what I, what I think based on the talks I've had with them these days, I mean, after pandemic, they want a job where they don't have to go to work. Hmm. It, they don't want to go to the office. Interesting, I mean, right. just like I've had more than one say, the second they make me come in, I'm moving companies. So that's the first thing. Okay. And then they want, you know, a salary that pretty much pays for, you know, a, a, a modest lifestyle. Okay. You know, that they, they, they have that covered. And then commissions on top of that. They don't seem to be particularly greedy, unlike previous days. Right, it's right. like, you know, it's fair, you know. Um, they don't seem to be motivated by uh, trips or that kind of thing. It's just more. And that's a change. It's very much a change. It's very much a change. I mean, if you're not in the office with people all day, yeah. the fact that you're number one on the board and I'm number four is like, oh. <laughs> Whatever. I don't even know Mike. <laughs> you know, you know. Yeah, right. So I think it's a little different. You'll have that same competition. Um, yeah. So you remember the, when they wanted co company cars and all that too? Yeah, yeah. They wanted and all company, that's changing. They, they wanted cars. Car. They wanted trips. They wanted all the recognition. They wanted lots of recognition. That, that was, used to be a really big deal. Right. And I think now, since it's more remote, that that's not such of a big deal. Yeah, and I wonder if that'll last. Probably not. Yeah. Because I think it's such a powerful human right, emotion right. to get recognized. Yeah, me too. But I, I'm with you. That's what I'm sensing. Yeah. Is that that need is not there right now. Yeah. And I'm just wondering how long that's going to go. Yeah. Well, maybe the company that goes over the top in that direction yeah. will lure some of those people back in. 
There you go. You know, that, oh, man, you know, uh, Frank works for ScanSource, and they're going to Cabo San Lucas. Or, you know, right. be interesting again, because I think most companies, you think about the CFOs, they're like, yeah, we're, we'll be glad to cut President's Club. You know, if they don't want it, we'll we'll cut it. You know, right. and we'll we'll down scare the office, and we'll you know, they like that. Yeah, I, a short term fix. Yeah, I think you're right. I think we got we got to watch out for that. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a trap. Because our definitely we've saved a lot of money not traveling, but we had that event back in October in Nashville. Yeah, two thousand people, and it was amazing. It was fun. It was awesome. Yeah. Oh my gosh, people. I mean. People seem to like it. Yeah. They seem to like to get out again and meet people. And so we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Um, what about just career paths for salespeople today? How many of these sales reps want to stay a sales rep like Phyllis? Can you believe we got Phyllis for 30 years? It's and, crazy. And she never wanted to be a manager. Yeah. I mean, I see them going three ways. I, I, again, these are some of my old reps. Some yeah. of them stay in sales and become high-paid professional salespeople. Right. SAP, Salesforce, right, you know, right, at Oracle, right, right. making big bucks, and they're selling monster deals. One of my reps just sold a $250 million deal. Wow. I never even heard of that. Wow. <laughs> it, was, it was to a shipping company. Wow. For all their global employees. Wow. It was Salesforce, all the global employees. Wow. And it was uh, that seven years of SaaS. So That's 250 divided by seven. Yeah. What is that? 30, 32 million a year or something like that? Yeah, right. So you just right. divide up the number of users That's by whatever. Yeah. Wow. 250. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's a wow. Good, it's good. It is amazing, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, and so that's what I'm wondering too. So some, I'm sorry, some of them do yeah. that. Yeah, some of them go into management and yeah. become like VPs of sales. A lot of the people right. that, that I coach are VPs of sales now, and then um, some of them go into you know starting their own business, like Millwood and Osborne right. and th- those right. kind of people. Right. And me and you and you know right. some people kind of go that that direction. And uh, well, I, I you know for me, I really think we need more. Up and coming salespeople. I mean, I love what you're doing with the, the the noobs idea because there's so many. Again, you know, in a lot of schools, they don't uh, they don't brag on the sales right. curriculum. Yeah, it's not one to say, hey, what is your school? You know, university. What what is your school famous for? It rarely do you hear somebody say sales. Yeah, you know, they want to talk about you know professions like legal and MD and all the other stuff, and you know, and then you get into the business school, right? right? But they don't tend to focus as much as I think they could on sales. It's yeah. one of the, I think it's one of the, our challenges. Me too. I mean, guys, think of the percent of people coming out of the schools that are going into sales. Right. It's huge. But it wasn't their major. No, they, right? not, there's not even a course on it. <laughs> right, right. I, I remember that's, the I Citadel right. there, I was like, I think I'm going to go into sales. What should I major in? Like, mm, probably business, I guess. <laughs> like, right. So the people go... Because <laughs> so, so if you think about it, John, maybe what they need to be doing is maybe the people that are better salespeople come, need to be taking classes in psychology. Yes. Right? And understanding behaviors. Yeah. And a little bit of finance, of course. Yeah. But, but you know, that, I think that's what we're missing. That would be good. Yeah, accounting, accounting and sales would be good. Yeah, why not? Yeah, that's good. I mean, yeah. accounting and psychology. Right, why not? Yeah, that would yeah. be good. So yeah. we'll see, but I, I think that's what we're missing is we're, we we don't have enough push on. We need more salespeople. Yeah. Well, good. I'm gonna, I'm I've got it as a backlog project to try to find try to connect with more of the schools that do have sales majors and yeah, try right. to help them somehow. I think it'd be great. I do some with uh, with Citadel now, but I need to do do more. I think it'd be great. Yeah. Well, good. That's all I got for you, man. Well, thank you, man.